Hello, friends and folks at home. This is William Owens, broadcasting on some unknown satellite frequency. This week has left me with some very odd thoughts concerning something I read a long time ago. If a man has a robotic leg, is he still a man? What about a robotic heart? Lungs? A brain? What about metal skin and hair made from strands of fiber optic cable? Perhaps he never stops being a man. Perhaps even a robot can think and love. Perhaps they feel pain and lust for a death long denied to them. Friends, if you still have ears to listen, then listen well, for I have quite a strange tale for you this evening. Incoming transmission. A week, dear friends. After narrowly escaping from the ape's planet, my studio was again set adrift on the lonely solar wind. I tried to keep busy, making an effort not to spend too much time staring longingly at the on-air light, waiting for another flicker, another sign of communication in my solitary studio. On Tuesday, I caught quite a vicious cold, which I admit still has yet to <coughs> completely fade. I spent a day making instant miso soup from freeze-dried packets and watching VHS tapes of Full House, which is the only entertainment currently kept in the studio, except for an equally outdated copy of Richard Simmons' Blast Off. I cleaned up the kitchen in the break room and built myself a makeshift bed out of couch cushions and a few old afghans that were being used as decorations in the lobby. My first night in a real bed, more or less, was sublime. I slept deeply and had no dreams. Hello, this is Professor Oblong broadcasting on all frequencies. My entire laboratory has been jettisoned into space. I'm not sure why or how, although I have found a small, oddly shaped box, which I believe... Hello, friends. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, the on-air light just started flickering, but now it seems to have stabilized. Anyway, after my night on the cushions, I awoke to a cacophony of horrible sound. Rushing to the front entrance, I discovered my studio now floated next to the hull of a gigantic, rusty spaceship. My friends, I, I wish I could properly describe the scope of this thing. Metropolis-sized, it hummed and creaked as it floated adjacent to the studio doors. I stood on tiptoe and pressed my face to the glass of the front window staring down the length of the huge leviathan. But the blood in my veins turned to ice as I spied the insignia spray-painted on the hull. Pirates, friends. I had been set upon by a band of vicious marauders. The skull and crossbones emblazoned on their flank were clearly styled from the skeleton of some alien race, but there was no mistaking that monochrome Jolly Roger. For the first time in my twenty-something years of living, I found myself wishing I had a weapon. Not just a blunt object or a knife, but a real, honest-to-God firearm. I pictured myself standing before the door, brandishing a pistol with fire in my eyes. Then I pictured myself building a series of elaborate traps, MacGyver-like, from bits of junk, and leading the pirates on a deadly game of cat and mouse throughout the building. Finally, I came back to reality, locked the door, and sat in the recording booth to wait. After a time, there was a hiss, and a man-sized tube began to extend from the side of the craft until it came to rest flush with the door of the studio. 
I heard another rush of air as the tunnel sealed itself against the ravages of the naked void. I was very frightened, my friends, but a little voice, like a curious whispering child, muttered incessantly in the back of my head. Go on, go on, go on, it chanted. Try the door, walk the tunnel, explore the infinite unknown. The voice grew louder and louder. Go on, go on, climb down, climb down. Until, unwittingly, I rose to my feet. That was when the footsteps began. A legion of perfectly synchronized marching boots echoing through the cavernous darkness beyond the front door. An odd sense of calm came over me as I realized I had nowhere to run or hide. I faced the entrance and prepared to meet my future with a calm and collected attitude. Perhaps the pirates would hire me on as a deckhand, I thought to myself, becoming somewhat enthused by the idea of sailing endlessly through the unknown universe alongside a band of merry thieves. Of course, once I saw them, I realized such an alliance would be impossible. Two by two, the pirates marched through the pressure-sealed tunnel until they stood just outside my door. There must have been at least a dozen. Identical metal monoliths, seven feet tall at least, made of rusty iron fitted together with heavy bolts. At first I believed them to be men clad in futuristic spacesuits or armor. Each metal man had two circles cut into their spherical helmet, eye holes, I thought, until I peered within and my gaze was met not by organic irises and pupils, but by a system of clicking lenses and blinking lights. I knew them then for what they were. Robots. Pirate robots. The mechanical creature at the head of the line beeped and whistled at me. Then, presumably responding to my confused look, raised his hand and projected a series of words onto the window. The words, miraculously, were in English, and they read, Open the door, or we will break it down. I know when resistance is futile. My flimsy wooden door was hardly going to stand against the two-ton fists of a squadron of robot pirates. I unlocked the door and stood firm as the scallywags marched into the room. At first, the mechanical warriors left me alone. Each one approached a different corner of the studio and stood still as a series of whistles and clicks sounded from within their metal shells. As my nose began to run, owing to the nasty cold I'd picked up, I edged tentatively towards the bathroom, seeking a tissue. I half expected to be accosted by one of the brigands and forced to remain in the front room, but none of them seemed to pay me any mind. Eventually, one of the robots approached me, a thin band of light shot forth from the gap in his helmet and ran the length of my torso. The towering figure paused as more beeps and clicks emanated from its brain. Then it said, Not ready, in a robotic tone, and moved along. This methodical scanning of my studio went on for a long time. So long, in fact, that I became rather bored. I attempted to approach the airlock leading to the pirate ship, but one of the androids blocked my path and repeated, Not yet, not yet, until I moved away from the door. I sneezed, which caused all the robots to pause and stare in my direction. They briefly communicated using a series of clicks and noises, then the one by the door repeated, Not yet, and they all went back to scanning the room. Feeling a bit out of place, I excused myself to the break room, where I prepared a hot cup of chamomile tea. This was made rather difficult by the presence of several of the hulking metal beings, who gathered in a clump and beeped at my mug as I removed it from the microwave. Over time, my condition worsened. My runny nose progressed into a hacking cough and a sore throat. I huddled myself in a blanket and sniffled whilst the pirates marched paths throughout the studio. At one point, all the robots got excited about something. 
I heard a series of whistles and beeps from the hallway and dragged myself, still swaddled beneath layers of afghans, to peer around the corner. A few metal men were gathered in a circle, still but for flashes of light which shone from gaps in their metal casings. For a brief moment, one of the mechanical beings straightened up, and a light from within his helm projected the message, We have found a box, but we cannot use it, on the wall. We have found a box, but we cannot use it. The robots seemed to sag a bit, their knees bending beneath the weight of millennia. Each one slowly returned to its task of analyzing the building, but they seemed diminished somehow. I had the distinct feeling of witnessing that moment in a romantic relationship when the fire goes out for the first time, leaving a smoldering wick that can never properly be relit. I eventually fell asleep, though that sleep was a pitiful one, full of tossing and turning, hacking and stuffiness. My whole head felt like it was full of snot. And every time I finally nodded off, one of the robots would beep or click, rousing me from my slumber. I finally got some rest, and when I came to, three of the monolith-like creatures were standing above me. I coughed a few times and sneezed once. The robot directly in front of me produced a stream of white light, which again ran up and down my body. It is time. He or she said to me, from my position on the floor, I couldn't help but notice the dullness of their metal bodies, the rust which caked their seams. I had the feeling, then, that these robots were old. So old. I had developed somewhat of a fever during the night. My head swam and I swayed uncertainly as I rose to my feet. One of the robots laid a comforting hand on my shoulder and steadied me as I stood. My vision dimmed as I placed one foot in front of the other, fighting desperately to stay conscious. I remember stepping from the lobby carpet onto the slick plastic floor of the airlock, and from there into a warm, damp hallway. My robotic captors urged me on, not aggressively, but with calm and considerate nudging as if saying, this is the way we go. This is the way we have always gone and always will go. The marching stopped, and I looked up to see we had come to a mammoth circular door. The port hissed as steam escaped from its vents. I caught the briefest whiff of lilac and coriander as the mist wafted past our group. I was led through the door and onto a bridge that hung thousands of feet above a silent city, filled with cyclopean towers of ancient stone, their windows glittering with soft yellow light. I was stunned. The exquisite beauty and grandeur of this cocooned metropolis touched me deeply, and I felt the feverish haze that lay over my mind lift, just for an instant. Yet, for all its splendor, I knew the city was dead the moment I looked down upon its winding, silent streets. The robots undoubtedly left behind, tools who had outlived their masters. As we boarded an elevator and ascended into the depths of the vessel, I spied a single skeleton, half engaged in the act of crumbling to dust, sitting in a lawn chair on the deck of one of the towers. He was clad in an ancient, yet brightly colored set of hooded robes. The movement of air within the ship had caused an artificial breeze, which made his hand stir, almost like he was waving to me. Of course, there was one other living thing on that ship with me, and as the elevator fell, I began to hear its sound in the darkness below. The air, already warm and thick with moisture, became like a jungle as the lift neared the center of the craft, and I started to smell something like, like iron, like blood. The environment did not help my sickness, 
A deep chill erupted near the top of my spine and spread throughout my body. I felt weak and sank to the floor. A moment later, I heard a series of whistling and beeping and looked up to see all my robotic captors staring down at me with concern. I know they didn't have faces or eyes, but the way they stood, the sounds they made, the way one bent a knee and carefully scooped me off the floor in his arms, I could tell that they loved me and cared about me, perhaps more than anyone ever had. I think I passed out again then. I awoke bathed in a cold sweat, the beating of a mammoth heart vibrating through my bones. I opened my eyes to see the thing, a gigantic, pulsing muscle that hung, suspended from nerves and sinew at the center of the gigantic spaceship. Despite the delirium brought on by my fever, I remember noticing how this chamber in the ship was clearly built for the heart, that it must have always been here, drifting through space, alone and alive, while the people living above perished from war or disease or famine. The robot set me down, very gently, in a corner of the room, while another entered carrying a set of very, very old blankets and pillows. This second robot was followed by a third, who heaped in front of me a pile of refreshments. Most were so old that they were little more than mounds of disintegrated starch. But one sealed jar of dried tea leaves proved well preserved. I asked the nearest robot for a mug of hot water. So sick I didn't even stop to consider that the chances of such a being speaking English are slim to nil. Somehow, though, they understood me, and while I shivered and wheezed, they fetched me a mug of steaming hot Irish breakfast tea, fully prepared with milk and two sugars, just the way I like it. The warmth from the tea spread throughout my body, and I fell asleep. I woke to the beating of the heart. The robots gathered around and stared down at me as I shivered beneath layers of fabric. Then, they all placed their palms underneath my body and collectively lifted me into the air. Moving with one mind, they carried me toward the heart while it thundered wildly. I remember realizing then how old it was, how terribly, terribly ancient. Perhaps it was a fever dream, perhaps something more, but I saw a vision of the heart and of how it had long ago been a man in an age and a place where men sometimes choose to be shaped and changed into formless masses of muscle able, somehow, to carry vessels safely through space at faster than light speeds. I looked up at that pulsing mass of flesh. I reached up to touch it and <coughs> sneezed. Alarms rang in my ears. I plummeted to the floor and was at once so cold as the blankets fell from me. The entire ship shook and spasmed. The robots fell to the ground in unison, liquid of a color somewhere between oil and blood running from the gaps where their eyes should have been. I tried to run, but near the end of my rope I could only crawl. I heaved my limp body down a long corridor, which I could only see dimly through my cloudy, fevered eyes. I looked up and saw the studio, somehow impossibly there in the center of the ship. But I was too far. I could feel the craft shaking itself to pieces. The alarms were, were fading as emergency power failed. Just before I passed out, I felt strong hands lift me off the ground and heave me forward. I sailed through the air, landing on the carpet of the lobby, and as the door swung shut behind me, I saw one of my robot friends. He had fallen in the act of throwing me through the door. But, just before the studio took off, he looked up, and I swear, I swear I heard him say, Goodbye, William. Goodbye, William.
And here I am, still alive but with more questions than ever before. I'm not sure I'll ever understand what happened while I was in the depths of my illness, but as I drifted away from the exploding spaceship, the computer screen at my desk went dark and then displayed the words, thank you. And I thought, maybe I don't need to understand. Maybe that thank you is the only thing that matters. We humans always spend so much time looking for meaning in our chaotic and confusing reality when maybe meaning just isn't that important. Maybe it's just about those feelings, those moments. Maybe it's not important how long you're remembered, just how happy you were while you were here. After all, it doesn't matter whether you're a bag of flesh and bones or a gigantic beating heart suspended in the center of a city-sized spaceship. One day, we're all going to die in the center of massive, fiery explosions. As for you, my friends, I hope that day is still a long way off. And if you ever look up into the sky and see a pinprick of white light flare in the far reaches of your galaxy, I hope you'll wave, for it could be me up there. And perhaps, if enough people look up and wave, perhaps I can find my way home. You've been listening to Space Cadet, a podcast written and produced by Andy Fleming and scored by Jules Bonner, featuring artwork contributed by Jesse James. The voice of Professor Oblong is Omar Saeed. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe to it on iTunes and like our Facebook page. Social media can be a powerful weapon, like the ancient blade Masamune. And, like that legendary sword, overuse can make you angry and crazy. Feel free to contact us by emailing william.spacecadet at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Viral infection detected. Self-destruct imminent. Thank you for purchasing. Hard drive. This unit produced and manufactured by White Knights LLC.